Frank, 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 Frank. We're not live yet. Wait, why not? Uh, <laughs> You're gonna give him a heart attack. <laughs> we should like. <laughs> I can't work I on know. the <laughs> She does. She does. People are going, God stinking drum with a
Good morning and welcome to New Life. It's good to see you on this Sunday after Labor Day and a special good morning to those of you joining us online. Well, before we jump in the announcements, uh, I just want to thank you for your continued financial support of the mission and ministry of New Life Glenside. Uh, we are still not passing uh, the offering baskets, but there are boxes located by the doors for your gifts and tithes, as well as your deacon's offering. And for those of you at home, you can also go to the website, newlifeglenside.com, click that give button in the upper right hand of the screen, and that's where you can also give your gifts and offerings. Well, of course, the church is the body of Christ, and we're called to care for one another. And as we gather this morning, one of the ways that we can do that is by praying for each other. Uh, the Lord's put us together to walk uh, with one another in faith, and we don't want you to have to bear your burdens alone. So after church, I encourage you, find someone sitting near you and pray with and for them. And of course, uh, Pastor Mark and our elders will be around. They would be delighted to pray for you as well. You can also uh, fill out a prayer card, put it in the box near the doors, uh, or email Pastor Mark at mmoser at newlifeglenside.com. All right, well, now that Labor Day is gone, there's a lot happening here at New Life, so let's jump into some announcements. First up, uh, Adult Ed kicked off a brand new series. It's done now. It was the 9 a.m. series, so uh, you could go. Hopefully some of you did go. Uh, so um, it's on the book of Jeremiah. be meeting over in the lecture room off of the library. Um, the book of Jeremiah is set in really tumultuous times, and Jeremiah, as a prophet, had a really difficult life. Uh, his message of repentance was not well received, uh, but he was a faithful uh, preacher and a dedicated and long-suffering follower of God. So join together with a bunch of great people as together we look at this amazing book of Scripture. All right, well, we had such a great time at the other ones. We've got another church picnic coming up, and it is on Sunday, October 10th. Uh, we'll be gathering about uh, between 1 and 5 p.m. at Fort Washington State Park. Uh, it's going to be a great time, lots of fellowship, lots of fun things to do. We hope to see you there, but we can always use help in planning. So if you can help with that, uh, want to get plugged into planning, let Greg know. His email address is up there. And uh, Women's Bible Study, that's coming up very soon, too. Um, all the important information is on that slide. But now I'd like to invite up Laurel Chapman to share with you a personal invitation and her testimony about Women's Bible Study. Laurel. Good morning. There's a lot more of you now than the first service. My name is Laurel Chapman. I'm um, with the Patriots fans over there. <laughs> Actually, shocked Josh isn't wearing his jersey. <laughs> Jesus said, do not judge. <laughs> uh, and I know many of you, as my husband Josh and I have been coming here for a long time. Um, but if you're new today, I hope you feel really welcome. Uh, we love it here, and I hope you'll return. And I'm not wild about standing up in front of a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> I woke up this morning, my forehead was peeling from sunburn. And you know, when you wear a mask, your forehead is like one of your best features. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but you know what? When I was asked to talk about women's Bible study, I was so glad because I love it. Um, ladies, am I right? It's really good. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many of you here serve and help with that ministry. I'm really grateful. Uh, so during college, I loved Bible study. The sharing and fellowship of God's word was delightful. And I loved the aesthetic, sitting around <clears throat> with my sweet friends, hands wrapped around a mug of coffee. It was cozy and just sweet. Uh, so fast forward a few years, and then I'm a newlywed at New Life. And when I heard about um, women's Bible study with a bunch of people that I didn't know in a Sunday school setting, I wasn't super interested. Our lives were fast-paced, always traveling, busy career, no kids. I did Bible studies here and there with a friend, and it was good. Then we started a family, and I was home with our baby, and a friend kept saying, come to women's Bible study. Some people have the gift of exhortation, and Amanda Larson does have that gift. <laughs> And I'm grateful to her, uh, so I, because I said, okay. Uh, 
Women's Bible Study is one of the anchors on our family calendar for me, and it's a big priority because I need the teaching, and it's so amazing to hear how God is teaching other women because it doesn't always come up in casual conversation. If you bump into someone, you say, how are you? How's work? How's school? And right there, Women's Bible Study people are teaching about their heart and what the Lord is showing them. Um, I'm grateful to all of you question writers and the people who pray, plan, lead, provide childcare, and organize, because this ministry is extremely rich. And my five-year-old recently asked me what rich meant. And of course, you know, money pops into your head, but actually what popped into my head as well was, I want to be rich in the knowledge of God's word. Um, I want to be rich in the knowledge of him. And that is something that will happen when you study his word. The teaching is rich at Women's Bible Study, and I encourage you to carve out time in your week to attend. We want you there. It doesn't matter if you haven't studied the Bible before. It doesn't matter if you've studied it a lot. God is going to teach you something. Uh, there are many options, and I don't think the bulletin does have the specific schedule, but downstairs um, on the table where you checked in, there's a flyer. And of course, the New Life website has the information as well. Um, I think I counted six options for attending through the week. Uh, and several have childcare. There's even a Zoom option. Um, if you don't want to come in person, that's fine. Do Zoom. But if you feel unsure about a long-term commitment, there's two semesters. And if you're feeling shy because you aren't sure about going somewhere where you don't know anyone, bring a friend. Um, or you can ask to be in my group. <laughs> Um, so I really hope my words today encourage you to attend, and men, you can encourage someone to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. All right, and finally this morning, uh, most of us know our deacons and deaconesses, and in a word, they are awesome. They do so much for us and our community, and here with the Deacons Minute is one of our deacons, Nelson Shane. Yeah. <laughs> with his brother cheering him on from the sound booth. Heads up, there's some scripture references. There'll be a test to follow. I've been here since with Bonnie since 1989. But about 2004, I received a call from an elder here at New Life letting, my, letting me know that my name was in consideration uh, to be a deacon here. And it asked if I'd prayerfully think about this. And after more than a year of training and preparation, I was ordained in 2006. 15 years later, and I'm a part of the diaconate that continues to serve here at New Life. I'm thrilled today to stand uh, before you and consider that and ask you to consider and look to think about a new generation of deacons. I want to encourage members here to consider men in this church you may know, the qualifications the scripture lay out and the leadings of the spirit to consider forwarding names to the elders uh, for this office of the church. It occurs to me that uh, sometimes we hear titles like elder and deacon, and we don't consider the gravity of this esteemed call or the, revel or the relevance in today's culture. The church is a holy institution, and the officers called to these positions are set in place with guidance from the word of God the book of church order and prayer. The word of God throughout scripture defines and establishes church order. And oh, if we can grasp that it's God himself who ordains helpers to his service. For those new to this or would like a refresher, let me con uh, consider some scriptures for better understanding. Exodus 18, 13 to 26 when Moses' father-in-law says, hey, you need some help, brother. Uh, and he gives advice. Uh, but note in those scripture that the qualifications there, especially in verse 21, 
There are several more examples in the Old Testament, but time's short. Acts 6, verses 1 to 6, shows this same principle, similar words as far as ordaining a group of men for helping with what today we often call felt needs. The qualifications of a deacon in particular is specified in, uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 18 to 13. So there's some scripture to mull over. Uh, also, you can ask maybe, what do deacons do? Well, different churches and denominations define the work of a deacon differently. But here at uh, New Life, according to the Book of Church Order, let me quote a few words. The office of deacon is not one of rule but rather of service, both the physical and the spiritual needs of people. Goes on to say, it is the duty of the deacons to minister to those who are in need, to the sick, to the friendless, and to any who may be in distress. It's their duty also to develop the grace of liberality in the membership of the church, to devise effective methods collecting the gifts of the people to distribute these gifts among the objects to which they are contributed. And in discharge of their duties, the deacons are under the supervision and authority of the session. A little bit of trivia here. Our training manual was written by a deacon who served here many years ago. Maybe you've heard the name Tim Keller. He wrote the book, Ministries of Mercy, the call of the Jericho Road, and it's based on Luke 10, 25 to 37. And uh, Look, I'd like to close by thanking you, New Life, for allowing me to serve here for these years and for the joy of serving. Thank you. Before I move on to the call to worship, I think Dan and Ginny Heron, are they here? Where are they? Uh, there we go. I just want to say hi. Everyone, make sure they have an opportunity to talk to them. Great to have you here. If you're able to stand for the call to worship, will you please do so now, even at home? And welcome to you if you're viewing this online. The call to worship is one verse today. Psalm 89, verse 1, it's about opening your mouth for two reasons. One, we're about ready to do, certainly, praise, but also to proclaim to the next generation. And we're going to hear about that in the message later today. Here is your one verse, Psalm 89, 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let me read that again. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship. Thank you. 
us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will proclaim your praise. Unlike Laurel and Nelson, I was not charged with giving a testimony this morning, but <laughs> my scripture reading yesterday landed me in Psalm 71, and I might want to encourage a, a, just two verses I'm going to read that I think should be more and more a prayer of mine and maybe a prayer of some of yours that fits the day. David says, since my youth, O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds, even when I am old and gray. Do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. This morning's prayer is shaped by Psalm 24, from which we just sang, Psalm 90, and especially Psalm 46, a song God's people have learned to turn to, or run to in times of trouble, like 9-11. It calls us to be still and know that I am God. And that could mean stop. Stop fighting and bow the knee to him. Or, echoing Moses' words by the Red Sea, stand still and see the salvation of our God. And I personally think the answer is both. But let's hear that call now as we come to God with our troubles. Let's pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in every generation. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so we come to praise you and to recall your faithfulness 
from generation to generation and to this generation. God, you are our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Would you make our hearts quick to cry out to you in every trouble? For there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the place where you dwell with your people. Lord of mercy, let those streams from your throne of grace bring life and healing and joy to your people, especially in the midst of times of trouble. We continue to ask for your mercy against the coronavirus. Particularly, we ask for protection for those who are most vulnerable among us and for wisdom and compassion to leaders weighing difficult ongoing decisions about these things, including our session as we prayerfully discuss what steps we should take next. We ask for mercy and strength for those among us who suffer from chronic conditions, those with mental health issues, and those who care for them. We pray for healing for those in our congregation undergoing cancer treatment, for Dave McDowell, for Bruce and Susan Mitchell's son, Paul, for Miska Brown and her family as she begins yet another round of cancer treatment, for Chris Reidenbach, particularly grant perseverance and give the doctor success in surgery next Tuesday to remove a blood clot. Father, grant comfort, hope, and joy and sorrow to those who mourn. We ask especially for Marcella McManus at the passing of her mother, Joanna, whose memorial service is tomorrow. And for Melissa Files and her family and the large extended family at the recent death of her father, John Kinnaird. Also for Ralph and Tina Holland, whose grandson, Trevor, died in a car accident just last Sunday. God, you are our refuge and strength. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Lord of all creation, we pray for those suffering the effects of Hurricane Ida from Louisiana to our own backyards. We ask you to give your people hearts and strength to show your mercy concretely, not only with kind words, but with hands that serve. And grant too that we would always be a people quick to show mercy. Bless the work of our deacons as they lead and assist us in this. God, you are our refuge and strength. When nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall, you lift your voice and the earth melts. So, Lord God, in a world filled with turmoil, show yourself to be the God of the nations and the faithful God of your people in every nation. Draw near to your people in Afghanistan today, especially pastors and those left behind and in grave danger simply for naming the name of Jesus. We pray the same for your persecuted church throughout the world. And we ask you to prosper the work of our dear friends serving overseas. Today we ask for Joe Q in the Middle East, George and Mardell in North Africa, Raja and Jessica in India, Ethan and Pampa in Kolkata. Lord of all the earth, may all be still and know that you are God. You will be exalted among the nations. You will be exalted in the earth. Now, Lord, make us a generation that seeks your face, whose hearts do not go astray, who do not forget your works and the wonders of your grace to us, who faithfully declare and reflect your ways to the next generation. Open our eyes to see Jesus. Open our ears to hear your word this day, sung and spoken and now proclaimed. And draw our hearts to love and worship and serve you with all we are and have, and to entrust ourselves to your wise, loving, and powerful hand, through Jesus, our rock and redeemer, in whose name we pray. For you, O Lord of hosts, are with us. You, O God of Jacob, are our fortress forever. Amen. Well, this September here, we have really no sermon series. Uh, four standalone messages, of which this is number two. Last week, we talked about work and rest for Labor Day weekend. And today's message will be passing the torch, uh, passing the faith to the next generation. 
But the next two weeks, I'm happy to say we have uh, a couple guest preachers. Uh, next week, we have Alden Groves filling the pulpit. Alden is not only a son of the church and uh, coming back here to preach, but also he's coming on staff as our new outreach coordinator. Yeah, so. And you'll have the opportunity to get to know not just Alden, but Taylor and Theo, their son as well. And then the last Sunday of this month, we are also pleased to say we have a old new lifer coming back, and that is the Reverend Sean Roberts. So Sean will be in town from Maine, and uh, so we're happy to have him filling the pulpit too. Now today is the beginning of, well, it's not really today, but this is the time where we think of the beginning of the academic year, uh, especially right around Labor Day or the Sunday after. Schools are, are in session now, uh, public, private, homeschooling, all of it is pretty much now in session. It's a great time to think about all the effort we put into the next generation through schools. Think about that. I, I'm, I'm looking, I see some teachers out there giving entire careers to this. All the money, all the time. The kids putting in all kinds of academic work. We do this in our society because we think it's massively important. And I agree that it is. And how about for a church? How about for us as parents, too, if you're a parent, and the next generation, and investing into them in terms of the faith, passing the torch. 1936, the Olympic Games for the first time involved the Olympic torch relay. And I'm sure you've seen it, the flame travels being passed from person to person and it makes its way to the host city. Now, when one torch is used to light another torch, they actually call that a kiss, which I did not know. And of course, that's a secret to moving the flame forward because each torch alone eventually bur burns out. So you have to pass it to another torch to pass the flame. Actually, as I was preparing for this, I thought how much of a misnomer it is to pass the torch. You don't pass the torch, you pass the flame because the torch will go out. The focus of a torch bearer, actually I have a slide on this sentence here. The focus of a torch bearer can't just be on their own personal journey with the torch. Their primary objective is to advance the flame. Let me say that again. The focus of a torchbearer can't just be on their own personal journey with the torch because their primary objective is to advance the flame. You've got to pass the torch or pass the flame to the next generation. And so I say this to brothers and sisters in the Lord. If you really love Jesus, if you really love God, and we'll be talking about the love of God here, if you really follow Jesus, then you can't just live your Christian life as a, just a personal journey. You got to aim at passing the torch, passing the flame on to the next generation. Let's get there, get to that destination through Scripture. When you think about Scripture on this topic, handing off the most important things in life, faith in Christ, faith in God, life. What scriptures come to mind? Well, I'm going to start in a place you might not expect. It's kind of like where the flame starts far away from the Olympic city. Let's start with a conversation. A lawyer asked Jesus a question. The lawyer says, teacher... Which is the greatest commandment in the law? The law. The law, capital L here, meaning the 613 laws. 613 given by God through Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Which one's the greatest? 
And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus did not say, hey, they're all equally important. Instead, he really does highlight one passage from Deuteronomy 6, which we'll get to next. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and your mind. That's the greatest commandment. And second one, love your neighbors yourself. And he goes on and says, all the law and the prophets, basically all the New Testament, with 613 laws and everything that the prophets said after that. He says, it all hangs on these two commandments. The greatest of which, love the Lord your God. So let's go to that Deuteronomy passage. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open to Deuteronomy 6. It's page 151, if you're using one of our black Bibles here in the sanctuary. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible and basically the last words of Moses before he dies and God's words to Moses. Deuteronomy 6, page 151. Let me read one paragraph starting at verse 4. It's a famous one. It's the word of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So there's basically two things here I want to talk about. One is love, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love, and then the second part about passing the torch is teaching love, the love of God that's commanded. So love and then teaching it. All right, so love, let's go there first. Love with a capital L. Last week I, I talked about capital W, capital R, and now I'm talking capital w, L for love. You know what, let me just make this clear. We don't actually have capital letters and lowercase letters in the original writings of the Bible. If you had the original writings of Deuteronomy, it wouldn't have uppercase and lowercase letters. It didn't have punctuation. It didn't have white space. And here's the real surprise, it didn't even have vowels, just consonants. Things like those expanded in time to make things more clear. But I think we could understand this as a capital L. That is, this kind of love isn't just some mere affection. This is the biggest love of all where with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and let me tell you, you can only do this for one person or one thing or one whatever in your life, only one can you possibly do this for. If you think there's two things or two persons that you can love with all your heart, soul, and might, sometime, at some time, those two are going to be in competition with each other and they're going to compete for your time, for your energies, for your schedule, for your money, for your commitment. There's only one. And God is saying, love me with all your heart, soul, and might. Capital L love is what that is. 
And this thing about love, big L love, only one. Can you love like this, maximum one? This actually takes us to some of the biggest questions of life about love. And sometimes it's not that we don't even know the answers. We don't know the questions. We can't put our finger on the questions. And let me try to do that with love here a little bit. When you ask, who or what should I love? Capital L. Who or what is safe to love? Capital L. Who or what is healthy to love? Capital L. Who or, who or what is, is right and good to love like this? Who or what is worthy to love? Capital L. And what kind of love is based actually on truth? Capital L love based on truth and not just mere hopes and imaginations. If you think about it, you, we all know someone who's loved someone, maybe marriage, that it didn't work out so well. That in the end, they might say, I love that person, but they weren't safe to love. They weren't healthy to love. They weren't worthy of the love commitment, especially if it's something that turns out to be abusive. These are big life questions, especially when it's capital L love that you're giving your entire heart, soul, and mind to. I can hear the 16-year-old in me. I'm 47, but the 16-year-old isn't dead. I grew up in the church, but I held God at arm's length for about my entire church upbringing. And if I would hear about this kind of love, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, I don't think it would have appealed to me as a 16-year-old male. And that maybe the thought would have occurred to me, why do I have to love anyone or anything like that? All heart, soul, and mind. That sounds risky. That sounds hard. I can love some things or maybe I'll get married. But you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll pivot. I'll shift. I'll get a new love. Why do I have to love like this? And I think, I think maybe there's something we might be missing there. If I could talk to that 16-year-old, it would be, well, that what you just described, you might actually have a capital L love that you don't know about, and that is yourself. Just to live life, loving or doing things, and then if they don't work out, if they don't serve you, if they don't meet my needs, if they don't float my boat, pivot, move, something else. What's underneath that very well might be a self-love, capital L. This is what sinners do on autopilot. Sinners on autopilot, whether they're reflective about it or not, this, this self-love is so easy. We might not even be aware of it. Self-love is what sinners do on autopilot. Why love the Lord your God? And can you feel the answers from the questions? Because to love the Lord your God is, is a love that doesn't recoil back on you in harm. It is a healthy love. It is right and good to love the true God that created you and redeemed you. He is worthy of this kind of love, capital L. And loving Him is based on truth, not our imagination. Capital L love, what a challenge. And I'll come back to this challenge. But where this passage goes next, and this is why I chose it, is it immediately goes to teaching the greatest commandment to the next generation. Teaching all the commands, teaching the whole faith, basically, is what the next few verses are about. So take a look at them again. It's amazing 
how this goes into that immediately, teaching. It's like if Jesus says it's the greatest commandment, I can hear Jesus saying, by the way, that's why immediately that it goes into passing this on to the next generation. How can we safeguard this? Like, a, like the, the precious family heirloom, how can we pass it on? Take a look, verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Can you really teach love? As I was preparing this, I remembered what my pastor growing up said to me privately later when I was in my 20s. He looked at me and he said, you know, and I'm from a rural area, as you know. He says, you know, we know how to pass on the farm, but how do you pass on love for the farm? How do you pass on the greatest commandment, the love of God. It's really difficult. It's amazing how practical this passage got quickly, though. And that is, talk about these things. Talk about the faith. When you're, when you're rising, getting up. When you're walking on the way. We might add when you're in the minivan on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. During a meal. If you notice, it's about a lot of ordinary time. When you're rising, you're going to sleep, a lot of ordinary time. And if you're a parent, this, this sermon is not just for parents. I will broaden it to all of us here in a bit. But if you're a parent, you have access to a lot of time, ordinary time in your children's lives. And not just time, space. Write these things on your house and on your gates, all around you. The tip here, if I could summarize it, is basically teach these things through ordinary time and ordinary space. It's not just about sending your kids off to formal education somewhere, although we certainly might do that. But ordinary time and space and be regular about it. That's how we pass on things according here to Deuteronomy. I'm not saying that's a complete formula, but it's a big part of it. It's really challenging. I, again, as I was preparing, that, I was thinking, oh boy, really challenging. Do I do this? Fill the time and space around you with your love, the love of God. If you don't, if we don't for the next generation, Fill appropriately time and space. Think about this. Will society do it? Will the world do it? Will the world teach? Disciple, catechize children today? Think about this. How about, let's just go to one aspect. Advertisements, commercials. Just listen to them with, through the ears and eyes of a child as they experience thousands upon thousands of products attempting to be sold to them. And listen to those. Boy, am I hearing a lot of commercials on gambling now. Last couple years. By the way, they don't say gambling. They say, usually, they say betting. Some reasons for that, if you might think through that. But whatever the product or service is, this... This here, you, you deserve this. This will make your life better. We know all the things that advertisers do. And what we might not reflect on is what the even more subtle message is. The temptation to self-love. Our product will help you. Be happy. You deserve it to get what you need, what you deserve. You hear that for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. What's the discipling going on there? Does it tempt one to self-love? This is why we struggle with self, 
self-centeredness? Or how about our educational system? I was a product of a public school system and I loved it. I had a great education. And, but yet, if you think about the reading, writing, ar- arithmetic, I mean, where, what classroom are they going to learn? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that this is healthy and safe and it makes you more human and God deserves it and worthy. This is some of the most important things for life. And, and you don't hear that. And I realize for, for different reasons that being a secular country, and I'm not challenging that here, but at least creates a vacuum that parents need to be aware of. They might go searching for other meaning in life, and this is the capital L love that we all need to hear. This Deuteronomy 6 passage does say, When it talks about children, it is implying, it's true, something really challenging for parents, and that is parents, you are, we are the primary, we have the primary responsibility for teaching our kids the most important things in life, including the greatest commandment, including the gospel, which we'll get to later, the gospel of Jesus Christ as we take the meal, the supper. You are the chief responsible party, parents, But all Christian parents want help here. All Christian parents don't want to be that only voice into their children's life. Don't they love having Sunday school teachers who are committed to them or or people, I love it when ordinary Christians who maybe not even teaching Sunday school or have no response, but they pour into my child's life. What a blessing that is. They do it for free. I get paid. I love it when Christians do this stuff for free into the children. Passing the torch, passing the flame. We have kids life here. Youth ministry, junior high, senior high level. Parents life starting up again here soon. This is important work. But I'm not narrowing it just to parents. Because as you can see, this is for all the church to invest in and to say, this matters. The next generation, how can I pour into them? How can I love them? It's something we all share. In fact, we're going to have a baptism. We're going to have a couple baptisms coming up the next few weeks. And you will hear, if you're a member of New Life, that question put to you. Will you assist in the raising and nurturing of this child in the Lord? All of us together. It's really quite important. As I was uh, discussing this with staff on Tuesday, this sermon, I had a couple staff members who said, Hey, Moser, watch out here. When you say passing the torch, it might sound like you're kicking the old people to the curb. Get out of the way, pass the torch. <laughs> As you can see, if you're here, nothing further from the truth. We all play that role in passing the torch until we're unable to do so. Uh, if, you, if, I, if I could pitch for Amy in particular in kids' life, she, I know she still has a few slots open. And some of you might be intimidated helping children You don't have to be a teacher. We have other roles. Talk to Amy. You know, say, I I want to be a part of this. Passing the torch to the next generation, loving them in Christ, teaching them the most important things, being with them, loving them. Please talk to Amy Lewis. She'd be greatly encouraged to have a bunch of people want to participate in that. Kids are worth it. One, One little quote here. I thought of this here as I was preparing. If you... If you want to leave imprints in the sands of time, you need to wear work boots. If you want to leave imprints in the sands of time, you need to wear work boots. And uh, it's worth working in this area to pass the flame on. As we turn the last few minutes here of what I have to say to the Lord's Supper, I want to talk about this greatest commandment with some honesty that maybe you were afraid to admit 
And that is, when you hear the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Is, is there something in you that doesn't fully like that commandment? Now, you might not tell it to the person next to you at church, but some of you, something that says, oh, my heart, soul, and mind, ugh. I don't like that. Sounds tiring. It sounds like it's going to take away my freedom. And you know what? If anyone in my life, any person would say, love me like that, I'd run far away from them. And that's a good response, by the way. And so why, what right does God have? You ever go down this trail in your thought, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian? What right does God have to tell me what to do, to love him like this? Sounds like a tyrant. Do you notice what's going on here? This is a matter, this is why we talk about faith, trust. You, you, you start to get worked up. Can I trust this God who commands this? Why him? So build your faith to build our trust. Let's talk about the love of God here. But so far, when I've talked about the love of God, I've meant our call to love God. The great commandment. Lo we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. But let us now talk about the love of God in the other sense of God loving us as we move to the Lord's Supper. And that is 1 John 4. Three verses, 1 John 4, 8 through 10. And this is supposed to be an encouragement to us who might not want to love the Lord God that much, might not trust his disposition, his heart, his intentions. Well, listen to this from the Apostle John. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And there's the first encouragement. It's not just that God commands love from us, and he does. But God is love. The very thing we're reaching for in life that we want to be love and to be able to be someone who is loving to others, John says God is that. The very yardstick of what love is. The energy, the activity of love, the definition of love. God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And there we have John saying, if you want to know God's love, it comes to the, us in the sending of his son. I mean, some of you have had very difficult lives. You might wonder, why me? It seems like my neighbor has had easier, an easier life than I have, and that might be true. And if you've especially gone through tragedies and heartache, it's that question of, if God is love, then how does he show it to me? And that need for reassurance, that need for, for wh wait, where did this manifest? This love of God. And John says it's, it's, it's that he sent his son into the world. It's in Jesus. It's in this supper. That is the great demonstration. So that we might live. Live through him. And the last part I'll read is not just about the son in general, but what he did on the cross, which gets us to the supper here. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In this is love, not that we have loved God, and if what I've said today or Deuteronomy has said is, is really challenging, cutting to the heart, who has loved God like this, all your heart, soul, and mind? Well, that is where we are as sinners. That is where all of us are, that we are going to feel convicted. 
But John gives us comfort. That's, that's not the deal. That we loved God first. That we worked ourselves up into such a great religious zeal that we loved God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And God said, that was fantastic. Now I can love you in return. Because you loved me first. Not at all. John's saying that's exactly backwards. We did not love him. And we had distrust in God. We want to just be left alone many times. And there is God loving us even then. Even to death on the cross, and you see how this is said, the propitiation for our sins. It's a fancy word, but basically it's talking about the atonement. Propitiation meaning on the cross, we were reconciled to God because God saw Jesus' sacrifice and is not angry at us anymore as he died for our sins reconciling us to God. And John is saying, this is love. God is love. He's the yardstick. He's the definition, the essence of love. And if you want to know how that met us sinners who did not love him first, it's in his death for our sins. When you hear the great commandment, if your heart gets stony, Think of this, the gospel, the good news of Jesus loving us first, God the Father loving us first and giving us that reassurance that loving God is safe, is healthy, he's worthy of it, he won't let you down, he did it so that you might live. That's the good news of the gospel. I love that word, when you pass the torch... It's a kiss. Passing the flame between two torches is a kiss, which is a word of affection, word of love, right? And the next generation is worth it. Some of you can think right now of adults who loved you, not just your parents, and isn't that great when your parents did and all they did for you, but other church members who poured their lives into you, loved you, and basically kissed you as they passed the torch. Let us pray as we move to the supper, and will the elders please come forward. Father, as we move to the supper, will you remind us what true love is? And that we might pass on this love to the next generation. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, a few words of instruction. Uh, we will be passing the kits around with both the bread and the cup. And we will have the elders actually still walk down through the aisle and be able to serve you in place. That's one of the great things about us having these more gapped aisles is that you being served is actually a picture of the gospel. You don't serve yourself. The most important food you need in life, you can't grow, you can't harvest, you can't earn. You need Christ to serve it to you. And the elders and myself ministering in his name together, not because we're special, but ministering in his name. Just like you didn't baptize yourself, pour water on yourself, you were cleansed by Christ, by another. It's a picture of the gospel. You don't have to be a member of this church or a member of our denomination, the PCA. This is for Christians um, all around the world. And if you're here, we're glad you're here with us. However, I want to I put a little bit of an exhortation out there that Scripture does, and that is examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith before you take these elements. This is for those who are in the faith. If you're not in the faith, we're so glad you're here. But Scripture says to examine yourself, make sure you're in the faith before you take this meal. That does not mean examine yourself to make sure you're sinless. Otherwise, no one would be participating in this meal. But this is for those who have faith uh, to be baptized and, and to make a public profession of faith. 
join us if you've done those things and you're part of the family of God. If you're not, please pray to the Lord in your seat. Reach out to him during this meal, and we'd love to talk to you if you're interested in what does it mean to be a believer? What's my next step? Or how do I investigate this? Love to talk to you personally about that. A couple details to end. If you need gluten-free, let the elder know we have gluten-free kits in the middle of the tray. And um, the kits, you have uh, two tabs. Uh, we're going to take the kits, the, both the, the bread and the cup together after the first song. So you can take the tabs off in advance, but hold them. We're going to take everything together after the first song. Now let me give you the words of institution. That is the words that Jesus spoke when he instituted this meal 2,000 years ago. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread as I now do, ministering in his name, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given to you, take and eat. And that same night, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. take the tabs off if you have not done so yet.
take the bread. This is love. Not that God, not that we loved God first, but that He loved us and gave us His Son. Take and eat. Now the cup. I'll repeat Jesus' words again. This is my blood, the blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Let's have a moment of silence in prayer. Father, we thank you for this kind of love, the love that we fail to give ourselves uh, to others and to you. You gave it to us in your son that we might live, that we might be forgiven. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Please stand and we'll continue to worship. Every day we'll bless you and praise your name. Let's add the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly
We added the doxology, so who says Presbyterians can't be a little wild and crazy every once in a while? <laughs> Please receive this benediction in faith that the Lord really does have kind and loving intentions towards you personally in the gospel. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Greet each other in the name of our Lord.